Amen. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, great. It's so nice to be here with you. Uh, if we've not met, um, I, I'm Matt. Uh, I've been married 25 years now, uh, which is, yeah, yeah, a round of applause to my wife, basically. Um, I can see the muted applause. Uh, she's called Philippa. She's a midwife uh, here in Leeds. And I actually, this week, became an empty nester. So I have three children. Uh, one, my youngest is now, uh, he's doing a year out in Istanbul, in Turkey. And he's working, he's living with a family and sort of working with one of our church plants there. Uh, my middle son is at York University doing computer science. He got sort of all the brains from Pip's side. And uh, he's, yeah, just entering year two. And Izzy, my eldest, who's 20. Two, I think. <laughs> um, she is quite confusing having three there, and they, they, those numbers keep on changing, don't they, every year? So um, she is just qualified as a physio, and she is working in a private practice um, and also doing lots of stuff with the church there. So um, it's a really weird experience now uh, not having three children around to eat all the food and make a mess and all that sort of stuff. So getting used to that. And um, uh, today, we've got three sessions together, plus lots of other time um, to hang out, have fun. And I, what I'm going to try and do is uh, I will sort of try and download a whole load of stuff to you, and then we're going to um, split down into smaller groups to give you a chance to discuss things. And I know not everyone likes that moment, but we will um, do our best to sort of mix it up, and hopefully we'll get somewhere by the end of it. Um, before I start, I just wanted to encourage some of you, um, in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, we're told the gift of prophecy is there to encourage, strengthen, and comfort the church. And so, uh, just as we worship there, I was just asking God, who do you want to especially bring some comfort to and encouragement to? And so, I've just got a, a few uh, people just to, I'm going to point to you, I'm going to say, this is how I think God wants to encourage you, and your job is to sort of weigh it before God, is that something that resonates, is something that's biblically true. Um, so I would like to start with this lady here, second from the back, blonde hair. You've got, yep, you're just turning round. <laughs> um, it's you. And I felt the Lord, um, uh, as I looked at you, remind me of Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, in Luke 2. There's this beautiful moment where an angel comes to her and speaks to her and says these incredible, beautiful things about how God's going to use her. And then the Bible says that she treasured the, those things in her heart and pondered over them. And I, I felt that the Lord's really been speaking to you and coming close to you. And I, I feel that there is a treasuring that's going on on the inside that perhaps other people don't know about or that you're not going to make a song and dance about, but actually between you and the Lord, there's a real, like God's at work at the moment. And, and I, I felt the encouragement for you is that the Lord loves how you're responding. He loves that you're treasuring the things that he's saying, the things that he's doing in your heart. And the beautiful thing about Mary is that it's a hidden role that has a huge impact being the mother to the Lord Jesus. And I felt that the Lord was just wanting to say that, that there's stuff to come in the hiddenness, in the sort of bit more of the backseat role that's going to lead to some impact. Either I don't quite know where, whether it's the people around you or in this church family, but there's something that's going to happen that's going to be perfect for how God has wired you. And sort of you're, you're wanting to be a little bit hidden, but also really hearing from the Lord. Is that okay? Yeah, good. Um, the lady that's behind Jack on the far corner, um, she's not looking at me now, she's looking at me, yeah. Um, I saw you running around a maze, and I saw you sort of running, almost like you were running from something, and it was a real frustration because it was a maze, so it wasn't just a straight line it felt like you kept on hitting these dead ends in your running away and you're like what is going on this is it feels so hard 
And um, I felt the Lord wanted to say, speak to you from Psalm 119, verse 133, which he says, uh, the psalmist says, Lord, direct my footsteps according to your word. And I felt the Lord just wanted to bring reassurance that you're running in the right direction or whatever you're running from, the two, where you're running to is more important. And he's used whatever circumstances that have meant that you've had to leave, that you've had to move, that you've had to shift something and feel frustrated in order to get you somewhere that he really wants for you. So the Lord is directing your footsteps. He's in control of of what's going on. And there is good things coming, even though the frustrations might be real. I hope that makes some sense as well. Yeah, great, wonderful. And, oh, Becky, I've got something for you. And is Steve, is he done the kids? Let me speak to you, but really I felt this is for both of you. I just, I got the word um, restoration. And I felt that there was this sense in which there'd been a whole load of healing and stuff that the Lord had done in your heart. And actually you were feeling more and more sort of, at peace with God's work in your life and your past and all of that sort of stuff. But I felt like the Lord wanting to say, it's now time to restore some things. So not just like get back to neutral, but I felt things that he's spoken in the past, passion, stuff to do with the lost, with mission, that sort of thing. I felt that he wants to restore some things now. And there's going to be a purity and there's going to be a love for things that you never thought you'd be able to love again. And a, uh, uh, and a willingness to go on the journey with him. Because he's done like so much. Like the, the, it's almost like he's leveled the ground, he's started again, and it's now time to build the house. It's now time to bring sort of restoration to some of these old dreams and that sort of thing. So, okay. Oh, don't like it when people cry, but I'm prophesying over this. It makes me want to cry as well. Oh. Heavenly Father, we just pray uh, just those three simple words that what's from you, what's from the very heart of God would serve to encourage these wonderful people. Lord, I pray that everything else would fall away and that you'd use these to strengthen them and for them to know that you really do understand what they're going through in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Right. Well, um, here we go. Well, this first session, uh, I want to give you four promises from the Bible that changed the world. And so we're going to look at the story of God's work with mankind. And everything is pointing towards being able to speak into this whole area of multiplication and all that sort of thing. So are you ready? We're going to do a, like we're going to cover a lot of ground here. So let's start with the first promise, which is the promise to Adam and Eve. So if we can go to the next slide, if that's all right. The promise to Adam and Eve. So the Garden of Eden was, if you like, the first temple. So it was the first place that God met with men and with women. And it was also the first place that God makes a missionary or apostolic command. He tells, he instructs Adam and Eve what he wants them to do. And what does he want them to do? He wants them to fill the earth. He wants them to multiply and so Eden was meant to be this first demonstration of the kingdom of God, the rule of God that was expressed through his image bearers, Adam and Eve. So the kingdom of God is such a hard thing for us to get our, uh, uh, our heads around, but it's the rule or the, the, the range of God's impact over something. It's his it's, it's effective rule. So everyone do this just with your right hand to squeeze your hand like this. Your hand, you can stop now, your hand is within your effective rule. You've got power there. You're able to wiggle your fingers. So this hand and these fingers, they're in your kingdom, if you like. 
God's kingdom is where he can do what he wants, where everything's in his effective rule. And Eden was that place where the kingdom was present. And when he says to Adam and Eve, you're meant to go and multiply, be fruitful. They were meant to expand that kingdom rule. They were meant to push out uh, into the world. But sadly, we all know that Adam and Eve, they choose to sort of rebel against this beautiful apostolic command. They go their own way. But even then, God makes this little promise uh, that the woman's seed, that a descendant of uh, Eve would bruise the serpent's head who had uh, tempted her and sin had entered the world. And so instead of the earth being filled with the glory of God, the whole earth being this temple uh, where God and mankind could enjoy relationship, Genesis 6 tells us now God saw that the earth had been corrupt and was filled with violence. And so we all know what happens in this absolute disaster zone. God sends or speaks to Noah. And Noah saves a remnant of his family from the flood. And when they step off finally into dry land, God repeats this apostolic command that he gives to Adam and Eve by telling Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 9. They do that, they uh, extend across the land, but the nations, uh, in rebellion to God, instead of multiplying through the land, they gather in one place and they build a tower, the Tower of Babel. And it is in that moment where God sees the resistance of mankind to this missionary command. They say, we don't want to be scattered. We want to build our own kingdom. We want to become, if you like, gods on earth. We want to reach and touch God. And so God crashes that tower down and scatters them across the earth. Promise two. Everyone with me so far? Promise two is the promise made to Abraham. This is the first missionary or apostolic promise. So we've had an apostolic command, fill the earth, go and multiply. We now get a promise. Genesis 12 says this, The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And there's a wonderful moment in Genesis 15 where God is wanting to so sort of promise to Abraham, show his seriousness in this um, uh, desire to bless the whole earth, is that he takes a local custom of making vows and promises where you take a load of animals and you cut them in two, and you place them on either side to make a pathway through the middle. And in ancient times, people that were making a bond or a promise would walk together through the animals, as if to say, uh, if I break my end of the bargain, let me be like these animals. Let me be ripped in two. Let me be killed. I I promise that I'm going to fulfill this vow, this promise that we're making. And in Genesis 15, you'd think it'd be Abraham that walks through the animals. But it's not. It's God. God, in the form of this, uh, this light, this lantern, walks through the broken animals to say, Abraham, if you break your end of the bargain, and if I break my end of the bargain, let me be pulled in two. Let me be killed in order to keep and fulfill this promise. And that's what we find out happens later as Jesus goes to the cross. Abraham as well, um, uh, with his son Isaac, there's a famous moment where God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, and just as he's about to kill Isaac, he spots a ram that's caught in a thicket, and he takes the ram and sacrifices the ram instead of his son, which leads to this affirmation of this promise again in Genesis 22. I don't know if we've got this, but Genesis 22 says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that's on the seashore. And so Abraham and his family grow. They form into a great nation made up of 12 different tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. And they find themselves going to Egypt. But 400 years later, 
uh, they find that they're oppressed, and so they call out to God, and God performs this incredible rescue of leading the people out through the Red Sea and through the Passover. They're set free again by great sacrifice and great power. And so they're free to go and explore, explore this promised land that God has for them. And it's here that God says something really important about the, what he wants from the people, like how they're meant to express and live in the good of these promises and commands to go and bless the, the whole earth. Exodus 19. Uh, have we got this on the slide? Exodus 19. Do we have that? Don't worry. Yes, we do. Great. Exodus 19. Let's read this together. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So there were three things that God wanted for his uh, people. They were meant to be this kingdom of priests. So a priest would be someone who acts on behalf of the people towards God or behalf of God to the people. They were like this in-between people. And he wants them to teach God's word to the world. He wants to represent uh, the whole people before God, but he also wants them to be a blessing to all peoples. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. And so just as the priest acted that way towards the rest of the nation of Israel, Israel was meant to act that way to the world. Israel was meant to be this kingdom of priests serving the world. But you know, I know as we read the Old Testament, that doesn't really happen. And then we find our third promise. Our third promise was the promise to David. God had always planned that one day his gracious rule would be demonstrated on earth. And David was to some extent a model of kingship that I guess was an extension or a, a prototype of what Jesus would finally be. Obviously not perfectly, perfectly because David failed often. But David was a king after God's own heart. Uh, we're told that he would carry out the purposes of God. And David receives this really incredible promise that his descendant, his seed, his son would be this king that somehow would rule forever. And that's what it says, 1 Chronicles 19. I declare to you that, so I think this might be 17, 1 Chronicles 17. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. And when your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. So David receives this promise that he's like this prototype king, but there is one that will come after him that's in his line that would somehow reign forever, would have a, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And then fourthly, the promises made to the prophets. These promises uh, included this idea that the person that would bring this salvation and change to the world would be a servant, Isaiah saw this anointed king that was also a servant who would bring God's blessing to all the nations. Uh, and all the nations would worship him. And everyone would be invited to worship. Isaiah 61 verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. This servant king would somehow impact all peoples, but especially the poorest amongst us. Not only would Israel be restored, but all the earth would somehow see God's salvation. The call on Israel was still through the prophets to be a blessing to the nations. But ironically, Israel only ever sent one missionary. They only ever sent one person out of their sort of tight-knit community. Who's that one person they sent? Jonah. And Jonah didn't even want to go. 
that's how bad they were at being this sort of missionary community. They sent one person, Jonah, and Jonah did everything he could to avoid being sent. And the promise of this servant, this king, who would particularly have a heart for the poor, sadly, Isaiah knew that this king would also have to suffer. Isaiah 53 is all about that. And the result of Isaiah 53 was that the people of Israel, as they are blessed by the suffering servant, they would have to increase the size of their tent. They would have to somehow grow as a nation to make room for all the nations that were going to come to them to know and love the Messiah. In the Old Testament, what we see through the whole story is that the Holy Spirit would come on particular people for a particular time, for a particular purpose. It was a a temporary thing. The Spirit would descend on someone and they would achieve what God had for them and then would lift off again. But the promises to the prophets seem to show uh, through prophets like Ezekiel that God also wanted to not just send this suffering servant Messiah King, but he wanted to work in the people so that they could be the people of Exodus 19, to be a priesthood of all believers, to be a people that would bless uh, the rest of the world. And so you keep hearing these rumors of the spirit that's going to come to change your heart of stone to a heart of flesh that rivers of living water would start to flow from within, that the Spirit would somehow be involved to transform lives and change people so that they could be everything that God called them to be. And finally, as the Old Testament ends, and there's about 400 years of silence, we finally find the Messiah has come. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus fulfills all these promises that God had made to his people Israel. He is that suffering servant that Isaiah saw was coming. He was the king in the line of David who would reign over the earth, whose kingdom would be established, whose kingdom suddenly was at hand and proved and demonstrated through healings and miracles. He was going to be the one that crushes the serpent's head, that defeats the devil at the cross. He would be the one that would gather the church and blow on them so that they receive the Holy Spirit. He'd be the one that as you put your faith in them, that you would find a new identity, a new heart suddenly springing forth. And he was the new temple, the place where God would meet with man, where forgiveness of sins was delivered. He was this living, walking, breathing temple that people could come to to access God. And so when he ascends back into heaven, the disciples have to work out what to do. What are they going to do with these huge promises made to Israel about who the people of God should be? Or what are they going to do with Jesus now being sort of the linchpin, the absolute focus of these promises? And so what we have is the early church trying to figure it out. And one of the disciples, Peter, he writes to a a new church, new believers, and tries to describe, or he tries to sort of put all of that stuff that we've just looked at together for a local church community, to sort of set the foundations right, to sort of describe to them who they should be. And so this is where you are going to do a little bit of work, okay? And it's not hard, it's not like technical or challenging. Everyone should be able to sort of give a bit of an answer. We're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to do... this three times. So we're going to read a couple of verses, and then I'm going to ask you, what does that mean for the church? And then I'm going to hear your answers, and then we're going to do that a couple of times, okay? You look really ready to work hard at this point, which is great. Let me read 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
Who is Peter wanting the church to be? Think of what we've just looked at in the Old Testament. What are some of the things that seem to carry on through and what perhaps is a little bit new about what he's describing? How is he just talking about Jesus? Okay? So I'm just looking for two or three answers each in each group. Do you want to go into little groups of three or four? Have a look at these verses. I feel like I'm asking you something really difficult, but it's not, I promise you. Who are we meant to be as the church? What is Peter trying to get out of the Old Testament into this new church? So, yes. It's chapter two, not chapter one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. I'm glad someone's checking up on me. I'm just making this up as we go along. Everyone done? About there? Has everyone got at least one answer? Okay, let's come back. Um, so who wants to go first? Like, who are we? What does this tell us about who we're meant to be as the church? Anyone want to give it a go? Spiritual house. We're a spiritual house. Uh, and what's another word for that? We're, uh, we're like a temple. So not only was Jesus the temple, but he commissions us to be a temple, not made of stones, but made of real people built together. Brilliant. What else? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, great. So what does that mean? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Brilliant. And what's the difference between the Old Testament call to be a priesthood and what it says here? Uh, yes. Let me just, it's a... That's right. So we are not called, that's great, sorry, I'm pushing this, but we're not called to sacrifice animals anymore. We're called to sort of uh, offer our hearts to God. That's our spiritual... That act of worship. Great. Anything else? We have, in our group, um, focused on the being chosen by God. So yeah. as God's people, we're, we're chosen by God. And that means that if you're in the church, you're meant to be. Um, he's been precious to you. He wants you to be there. He's chosen you to be part of this. Brilliant. So that word precious, we had a word earlier, didn't we, about that, that you're the apple of my eye. And so there's this affection, there's this love, there's this delight that's happening in the church as God calls you together. 
So, yep, so we're a holy priesthood. We're made holy by Jesus. We offer spiritual sacrifices, which are our hearts. And I, I hope you get the whole tone of this, that the, the foundation, everything this new temple is built on is Jesus. He's the stone that was rejected, who's now become the cornerstone, the capstone, the most important stone for the house to be built on. Great work. That wasn't too hard, was it? Everyone relaxed? Yeah, great. So let's go to 1 Peter 2. It will say 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. He continues, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So same again, just turn around to the same people. Who are we? Who are we as the church? What are the themes that are being repeated or even tweaked and changed and maybe upgraded? Why don't you just turn around, have a little chat? Ideally, we were finishing this one at 11. Yeah, great. 15 minute range. And then back I think I'm almost on track. Yeah, there's, That's there's great. Loads of rooms. We're How's everyone doing about there? Okay, so who are we? Who are we? Let's have some answers. Recipients of what? Really good. So just to help that it's all on Jesus, but we receive stuff in order to be the church. And what do we receive? We receive mercy, the grace of God. The thing that calls us all in is that it's all by grace. None of us have earned it. None of us deserve it. But God in his grace and mercy, once we, what's it say? Uh, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, you now have received mercy. So important that. Love that. What else? Who are we? Yeah. It builds on the, the biblical prayers of our chosen. Yeah. So we were pulled out of the darkness into the light. And that whilst we're, it's where once you were not a people, but now we are. Yeah. So, um, just how we um, take people from everywhere, and all walks of life, and all socioeconomic different status, whatever. Um, but we were all pulled together by God. Beautiful. The word that there is used is special possession. So a special possession is, imagine, and you know, it's not a great thing to think about, but imagine your house was burning down and there was no people in the house. What would be the one thing you would take with you? That is your special possession, okay? Why don't you just turn to the person next to you and tell them what that thing would be? What would you take with you? Very good. (laughs) 
Very good. I felt like I heard quite a lot of electronic gadgets <laughs> being described there. Nothing sentimental, no old photos, the laptop or the phone. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> It's really sorry, I'm an old person, and uh, I still have actual photos, yeah, like I have an actual Bible. Um, uh, <laughs> anything else? Anything else? Who are we? Yeah. We're... Oh, you're telling me what you're going to take. Oh, I see. I'm back to who are we. You're telling me a dog. I'm like, that's not in the text. <laughs> Yes, and that is what my wife would say, and it's not what I would say, yeah. Uh, <laughs> should we come, can we come back? Or do you want to, okay, thanks. Both the passages, I think you were talking about continuity and discontinuity yeah. in the Old Testament, and obviously there was a temple in the Old Testament where the temple was, and the people went out of the there was priests, but that was only the ironically had to be a descendant of Aaron. And there's an upgrade, because it's not just a priesthood, it's a royal priesthood. So it's almost like our status has, has gone up a little bit as we are brought and adopted into the family of the king. We have suddenly become royal. Anything else? Yeah. Yes. So there's a, two things are happening there that we receive in order to sort of give out. So we're not giving out of our own resources. We're receiving to give. Very good. I love that. So from darkness to light. Darkness to light. So there's a, there's a real stark contrast to wh where we were and where we are now. Let's do our final one. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So quick chat. Who are we as the church? Excellent. Okay, so there's just a couple of things here to sort of pick up. What do you see? Who are we meant to be? Countercultural. Countercultural. Give me a little bit more. What do you mean? Um, so you didn't know I was going to ask a follow-up question, did you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that holiness, that being set apart, it, it seems to be talking about having purity rather than giving ourselves to sinful desires and also what does that do what's the impact of our godly living we stand out and though the pagans though they accuse you of doing wrong they may see your good deeds and do what glorify god so there's, there's this element to which we are called to be like set apart, holy, but it's not for us, the holiness. It's for the world. And so we are meant to have a provocative witness. We're meant to live in such a different way that the world sees that we're different and we live for a different purpose. 
but it's for them. And when the church isn't holy and isn't set apart, the cost is paid by the world, not just us. Because God's calling you to be this holy priesthood for their sake. And so bringing all of that together, next slide. Every church calls it something different. But in this little passage from 1 Peter 2, you have the up, which is to God. Some, some churches call that worship or focus on God, where we're called to be this holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to Jesus, worship of Jesus. You've got the in, the way we treat each other as a chosen royal people, holy nation, God's special possession. We're a community chosen by God in his grace. And then there's an out. We're to be this sort of outward-facing community that is holy for their sake, that reaches out, that shares the gospel, that is a provocative witnesses, that makes disciples in people that are in this local area, but also people all over the world, because Israel's calling was to bless the nations of the world. And we are now equipped, because our hearts have been changed by the Spirit, to be those people that impact the world. And it's the out that I'm here to speak to you about today. Because generally speaking, every church is pretty good at the up and pretty good at the in. And it's the out that we really struggle with. It's the out that we don't feel equipped for. It's the out that's scary. It's the out that's costly. And so session two, I'm going to talk to you about what it looks like if a church really gets hold of the out. Amen? We're done. Ellie's coming up.